And I'm Claire Pierce, and I'm your host for this session today. Um, I work as part of the Sustainability Hub Low Carbon Devon team here at the university, which is an ERDF funded project designed to support Devon enterprises on their low carbon journey. Today, our speaker for this workshop is Mukti Mitchell. He's a carpenter, sailor and an author who's written several online carbon footprinting calculators. In this workshop, Mukti will give an overview of the main elements of an average carbon footprint, simple steps to reduce your carbon footprint in each of these areas, and how this will improve your quality of life. Um, obviously, as with all the other sessions, during Mukti's presentation, please do post your questions in the chat, and I will take as many of those at the end as possible over to Mukti to answer. So without further ado, I'd like to hand you over to Mukti to talk about carbon footprinting. Mukti. Hi, thank you very much, Claire. And it's really good to be here as part of this fantastic Sustainable Earth event. And um, let's start the presentation. So here we are, Sustainable Earth 2021, win-win, how to improve your individual carbon footprint and quality of life. And um, I'm Mukti from Carbon Savvy. So I'm going to start today um, with a poll because I want to start with you. I want um, us all to start on our journey towards a low carbon lifestyle. And um, it all starts where we are um, as individuals. So it's quite an interactive session that I've designed for you today. Hopefully all the polls and different questions and things are going to work. Um, but we're starting off with a poll. Um, which asks, how much do you know about the carbon footprint of your daily activities? So um, if we could have the poll live, please. And um, there's four different options for the answer. So um, if you could select the option that fits you best. Now I just need to ask tech support, will I will I know when the polls complete? Um, or shall I just guess? So I think that's enough time to answer that poll. So um, if, if it's possible to show the results of the poll, that would be good. Let's see, that might come up. I'm going to, and then I can refer back to it. Um, so moving on, um, that's the first question. And um, now I want to tell you a little bit about myself, how I come to be talking to you today about carbon footprints. So I love um, writing carbon footprint calculators and I wrote the carbon footprint calculator for Resurgence magazine back in 2002, um, which came first in a survey of carbon footprint calculators on the World Wide Web. Um, I love giving talks. I've given over 200 talks and workshops on how to reduce your carbon footprint and improve your quality of life. I love sailing, um, that picture in the middle, and I sailed around Britain in 2007 um, to promote low carbon lifestyles, um, giving 45 talks on how to cut your carbon footprint in all the, in, in yacht clubs and town halls and schools around the coastline, visited 65 ports over six months. Um, and um, thanks to all the little local um, newspapers, radio and TV, um, it was to my great astonishment, um, reached an audience of 10 million. Um, and then I love insulating period properties. And so with my other hat, you, you know, um, my kind of charitable work, if you like, is promoting low carbon lifestyles. But with my other hat, um, my day job, if you like, is insulating period properties. And I established a company called Mitchell and Dickinson in 2010 
and we insulate period and listed properties. We've insulated over 750 properties and um, we've insulated an entire heritage village um, in Clavelli in North Devon. And um, um, that's uh, saved over 15,000 tonnes of CO2 through all the insulation that we've done to date. Um, I'm just checking because I, I might be able to see the results of the poll. Okay, let's see if I can see the results. I can just see, I can feed back to you. Okay, so 4% of the people here on this uh, seminar uh, had no idea of the carbon footprint of any activities. 30% uh, have a vague idea of the carbon footprint of a few activities. 68% uh, have a rough idea which um, activities have uh, big or small carbon footprints. And 8% are very clear uh, which activities have big or small carbon footprints. So thank you, everyone, for taking part in that poll. It's good to, good to see where we all are to start with. And then we'll ask the same poll at the end of the session. Hopefully, um, things will improve a little bit. So um, that's a bit about me um, and quality of life. So again, I'm starting with quality of life. But this session's about carbon footprinting and how it improves your quality of life. But I'm starting with quality of life today um, because, I, as I said, I want to start with you. And I want to show you through your own answers to your own uh, to some, some questions. Um, I want to show you, in a sense, give you a reflection of your own view on the relationship between quality of life and carbon footprints. And you'll see what I mean in a minute. So um, quality of life, what does this mean to you? I would love it if you would be willing to write some key words in the chat. Um, it's a little bit of a meditation, but just some key words. What does quality of life actually mean to you? I'm going to have a look at the chat. And um, as you... Uh, enter some things i should be able to read those out but but i could share with you while we're waiting for the answers to come through i think there's about a 30 second delay on the system so i could share with you some of the things that quality of life means to me um i have this idea that to have 100 percent quality of life i would need to be spending every minute of every day of my life doing something that i really really enjoy um, and so I can't have, to get 100% quality of life, I couldn't have any dead time, so I can't sort of, even though I don't enjoy driving, say, if I take a car to get me somewhere quicker to somewhere that I really enjoy the quality of life, that wouldn't work because I lose out an hour or two of my day um, in something that isn't 100% quality of life. So that sets an interesting uh, perspective on it, I think. So I've got some answers coming through. Um, we've got Sam Pullman says, peace in my heart. Jasmine Doug says, contentment. Sarah Lee says, happiness. So um, we've got Simon Gibbon, time to think. We've got happiness, um, time to relax, balance, good health. Thank you for all these comments. Healthy diet and calm state of mind. Two wonderful aspirations. Healthy diet and calm state of mind. Safety. Um, breathing space, yes, that's two two meanings for me. Breathing space, it's kind of uh, metaphorical, and then the actual quality of our air. Good quality, healthy food, no war or conflict. Time with family and friends, spending time outdoors, time in nature, appreciating the small things. Thank you so much. Contentment, family time, safety. That's it. So. Um, uh, enjoying time with friends and loved ones. Brilliant. So thank you for those great uh, comments. So um, quality of life means something different to everyone. Um, now, here we've got another poll. I want you to um, enter. What is your quality of life today on a scale of 0 to 10, in which 0 couldn't be worse, 5 is average, and 10 is heaven? Could we bring up that poll, please? And um, I think it's just in three sections, the answer. So um, it will be easy. You just got a choice of three. Um, OK, so thank you. Quick responses from everybody. So um, not to four. There was nobody in our in our call today who's got a, who rates their own quality of life of not 
0 to 4%. Um, but um, so far, oh, it's, the poll results are coming in as we speak. Um, and about 55% of people would rate their quality of life between 5 and 7, and about 45% of people rate their quality of life between 8 and 10. So lucky us, and congratulations to us. Lucky us, we, um, we have a really good quality of life. Um, everybody's sort of above level 5, and, and, and a lot of people are um, actually... Um, you know, between eight and ten. So that's brilliant. I also want you to hold that in your mind um, during the talk. That's where we rate our quality of life today. And as we start to look at some of the actions that we could take to reduce, to improve our quality of life, we can hold that in, a mind, in our minds against, uh, against this poll. So thank you for that. Um, now, uh, another, as I say, the first part of this talk is quite interactive. I am going to give you a presentation, don't worry. I'm going to talk to you about how to reduce your carbon footprint. But I really want to get us established in our, our where we are on our own journey uh, in this question of quality of life to start with. So uh, bear with me. I'm asking quite a lot from you at the beginning. Um, so I want you to uh, think up three actions that you would like to take. And this is all going somewhere. And I think you'll like the result once we've done these actions of, of what it's going to show us um, about the relationship between quality of life and low, and, and low carbon footprints. So um, three actions you would like to take to improve your quality of life. One action tomorrow, one action next week, and one action in the coming year. Now, I want you, when you, I, I'm going to ask you to write some actions that you'd like to take in the chat. Um, but I want you to think about things that you can really achieve. So very achievable actions. So for tomorrow, for example, for me, first thing that pops into my head is um, go and stand outside for five minutes as soon as I get up and just breathe in the fresh air. So something very small, easy that you feel that you can and you actually would hope and intend to achieve tomorrow, next week and in the next year. So let, let's make this really real. So um, in the chat, if you could share um, some ideas you've got to improve your quality of life um, in, um, in this uh, time frame. Right, I'm going to find the right place so that I can start to read out some actions that you're proposing to take. Um, Right, here we go. Please write some. So let me think, while, while we're waiting for those to come through, I'm going to share with you um, some of my ideas. So tomorrow I'm going to stick to that idea. I'd like to go and stand outside for five minutes as soon as I get up and breathe the fresh air. Lovely, cool, crisp morning air. And what can I do in the next week? I would like to take, I've heard recently that taking 10 deep breaths um, rebalances your whole nervous system. So I would like to, I'm quite good in the morning, I do a bit of meditation in the mornings, but in the evening I would like to, um, before I go to bed, I would like to take 10 deep breaths. Um, and in the next year, something I'd like to do in the next year, I would like to, I go sailing. I'm really into sailing anyway, but I'd like to go sailing on the sea. I normally sail in the estuary, so I'd need to go in a, in a, in a sailing, bit more of a sailing yacht. So that's my three comments. Now, um, I'm going to read out some of yours as yours coming in. Move more, learn more, be, a, be more aware. Go for a walk. It's just so simple, so easy, and so fulfilling. Scheduling, taking a walk time at lunchtime, but regardless of the weather. Work less, see some friends, drive an electric car. Okay, yeah, that's the three for the three different sections. Thank you. One, meditate. Two, move, get in the sea. Like it. Appreciate what I've got. Spend more time for myself. Stick to daily habits and routine. Friday night Sabbath with my family, including my granddaughter. Drink morning coffee in the garden. Pay attention to nature around me. Spend time outside. Progress with writing. To stay in employment that makes me happy, very important, uh, meaningful work. Adventure with my child, lovely. Next week, construct my greenhouse, love it, love it. Ambitious, I hope you succeed. Nick, 
Um, tomorrow, exercise. Next week, meet friends not seen in ages. Yes, that's going to become more possible, we all hope, soon this summer. Uh, next year, finish studies and get a secure job. Go for a run, tidy my study, retire. You know, there's a nice expression I hear, retire with a Y. Retire. I quite like that. Um, it's the new way to retire. Um, get away for a six-week sabbatical. Lovely idea. Hopefully that will come up during my talk. Um, it's a great way to travel. Cook a proper meal for dinner. See friends I haven't seen for a while. Okay, cycling, greener changes at work, walking, yoga, plant-based diets. So we get the flavour. Thank you so much for all of your comments. Um, and I can't read out all of them, but they're on that same theme. Good. So this is we're concluding this important part of this uh, presentation where you're going to see something about the connection between quality of life and um, low carbon footprints. So I'm going to go on to the next slide. This is the last poll of this section. Would you say that your choices to improve your quality of life, and I know I haven't talked yet about what's low carbon or high carbon, so I'm just leaving you to guess. In your present understanding of what constitutes low carbon activities or high carbon activities, the, the actions that you chose to improve your quality of life, would you say they are low carbon or high carbon? And there's a poll, if we could make that poll live. Um, I'll read you out the results as they come in. So, how about this? I haven't said a word yet, as you can tell, a bit about myself. I haven't said a word about low carbon. I haven't said a word about quality of life or anything. Just all about your own answers to these questions. And I don't know if you can see the poll live, but I can read out to you um, that based on what you know, were your choices low carbon or high carbon, about it's changing around, but about 85% of you all think that your choices to improve your quality of life are low carbon. And 15% of you think that your choices to improve your quality of life would be high carbon. So that's sort of concluding my, my hypothesis, if you like, um, that I hope you can feel from your own thoughts about your own life um, what the amazing thing that comes out of this, it, was, it absolutely amazed me when I first saw this pattern, that not only does, in my opinion, imp uh, reducing your carbon footprint improve your quality of life, but genuinely improving your long-term quality of life reduces your carbon footprint, as we can see from this. So thank you very much to you all for taking part in, in all these questions. Um, and now I'm going to give you a bit more of a talk. Um, so the first kind of information slide, we're going to look at what psychologists say about this subject. So what doesn't make us happy according to psychologists? Money, material possessions, intelligence, education, age, gender and attractiveness. Few. Um, that so many of the things that we spend so much of our time chasing after, in fact, don't, don't make us happy at all. So uh, maybe we, we don't need to give so much time and energy to those things. And what does make us happy in order of importance? The top one, family and relationships. And some of you put in the chat, you'd like to spend more time with the family, more time with your daughter, etc. Family and relationships is the biggest factor um, that, to make us happy. And then secondly, meaningful work. A couple of you mentioned that. Positive thinking, uh, gratitude, forgiveness, giving to others, spiritual connection, personal freedom, good health, and some entertainment has a, a, an influence there as well. So um, really interesting to see what psychologists say how that reflects on the answers that we all gave earlier on about the things we want to do to, to um, improve our quality of life. Now, it's important to note that there is a difference between quality of life and happiness. Happiness is a mood, and however good your quality of life is, we're all going to experience happiness and sadness in our lives from time to time. That's inevitable. But I like to think that a high quality of life supports greater happiness so that if I have a high quality of life, 
Um, that's providing a kind of foundation to enable me to be happy more of the time. Now we're going on to switching on to the carbon questions for this talk, the carbon cycle. So I'd just like to explain, many of you will already know this, but it's um, just to, you might enjoy hearing it again in different terms, or for some of you who don't know about the carbon cycle, uh, to hear it in very simple terms. So there's a big exchange going on on this planet between two great groups of, of beings, the plant uh, realm and the animal realm, which of course we as humans are animals. So plants, um, uh, we eat plants and um, we consume, uh, plants are made of carbon, so we consume uh, carbon by eating plants and we consume oxygen from the air. Um, and we put that, take that into our bodies, the carbon and the oxygen, and we turn it into carbon dioxide, which is carbon and oxygen, and we breathe out the carbon dioxide. So that's, that's a complete uh, chemical process. And then the plants actually breathe in carbon dioxide during the day when they're photosynthesizing, and they split it, split the carbon and the oxygen, they store the carbon in their bodies, because they're all made of carbon, You've heard of carbon-based life forms, plants and animals were carbon-based life forms. If you take out all the water, we're mostly just carbon. So um, plants uh, split the car breathe in carbon dioxide, split it, store the carbon in their bodies and breathe out oxygen. And so through this exchange between animals and plants, we've got a perfect cycle which keeps these two gases in, in balance and has done for millions of years on planet Earth. Um, but... Um, humanity discovered fossil fuels, um, which is old rotted down plants and animals. Um, so a big store of carbon. And the Spanish word for coal is carbon, which means carbon, because coal is basically carbon with a few impurities. And, um, and oil is liquid carbon and gas is, is gaseous carbon. So uh, we discovered this um, store of, uh, of uh, carbon and we found it's got incredibly high energy density. So we can burn a little bit of um, this stuff and we get lots of lots of energy out. I mean, to give you an idea how much energy there is in fossil fuels, one litre of petrol contains the same amount of energy as a person working for four and a half days. So if I ask someone to lift bricks up a hill, um, it will take them four and a half days to lift the same amount of bricks as what I can lift with one litre of petrol. So um, petrol is incredibly valuable stuff and we need to treat it um, uh, with great care because it's, it's, just, it's just too good uh, to waste. So that's the carbon cycle. And then uh, the bigger picture of the carbon cycle is that they've taken, they've studied air bubbles trapped in the ice caps and they've carbon dated them. And um, so they know that these little air bubbles are, are hundreds of thousands of years old. And then they've collated all the results and they've worked out what the balance of gases it was in Earth's atmosphere over the last few hundred thousand years. And they've also, um, they know what the heat and, and, and ice ages have been over the last a few hundred thousand years. And Al Gore famously did a great graph of this, um, which basically shows that they worked out that the temperature goes, the temperature on the planet the planet goes through a heat age and an ice age roughly every 100,000 years or so. And the balance of CO2 in the atmosphere goes up and down in relation to the temperature on the Earth. So when the Earth is really hot, there's a lot of CO2 in the atmosphere. And when the Earth is cool, there's not so much CO2 in the atmosphere. So they were able to draw this conclusion that actually um, when there's a lot of CO2 in the Earth's atmosphere, it, it finds it difficult to keep cool. And so at the moment... Um, we've, by burning all these rotted down plants, the fossil fuels, we've increased the quantity of, of CO2 in the atmosphere much beyond what it's been for hundreds of thousands of years. Um, and therefore, carbon dioxide works a bit like a sort of blanket, a see-through blanket, like a greenhouse effect over the whole Earth. And the sun's rays come in a bit like through a greenhouse, but not so much heat can go back out. So the planet starts to warm. And um, that's why it's called greenhouse gases. And so what we need to do now is we need to stop emitting more carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. So that would be called getting to get net zero, which, you know, lots of councils and the world's governments have got a target to get to net zero anytime between 2030 and 2050. And then also 
once we've all got to net zero and stopped emitting more CO2, we then need to draw down the excess of CO2 that's already in the atmosphere. About a trillion tonnes too much CO2 is in the atmosphere. We've got to draw that down. And you'll be pleased to know that um, there's ways that we can do that using the natural forces, in fact, using plants, because um, that's what they're brilliant at doing. So that's the carbon cycle. Now, UK carbon footprint. The UK's national carbon footprint is the combination of the carbon footprints of all the 67 million people in the UK. And that's it, because there's no activities here which aren't uh, to supply some goods or service to a private individual end user. So um, the carbon footprint of individuals represents all the emissions and in industry is not separate to individuals. Industry is all producing activities. Uh, producing services and products that are used by individuals and even government and defense and education and health they're not separate to our individual carbon footprint our share of government activity our share of the health service our share of um education etc um goes into our own carbon footprint so um the, the individual carbon footprint is a reflection of the national carbon footprint on a very small scale. And a typical UK carbon footprint is around 15 tonnes of CO2 per person per year. And this includes international manufacturing, aviation and shipping. Um, and the re reason it's important to understand this is something called territorial carbon footprint, which is only the emissions from the geographical territory of the UK. Um, and so sometimes those get quoted and that would say somebody might say or the government might say oh that the UK average carbon footprint is seven tons that's if you take all the emissions from the geographical boundaries of the UK and divide it between 67 million people but um, if you actually look at all the activities in China and India manufacturing products that are used in the UK and all the shipping to bring things to the UK and all the aviation uh, we use as UK citizens that's called a consumption carbon footprint, and that's more like 15 tons. You know, plus or minus, there's different, there's some different figures out there, but it's a, a typical one, it's about 15 tons. In five main lifestyle areas, heating our homes, transporting ourselves around, food, holidays, and products. And in some carbon footprints, those will all be equal. Others, some will be bigger. Other ones will be smaller. And every individual's uh, footprint is slightly different. Now, reflecting back on quality of life, what's the connection between um, uh, these five lifestyle areas and raising our quality of life um, and reducing our carbon footprint? But if I go back to the question, how do I achieve the highest quality of life? And I ask myself, what kind of home heating would I have or what kind of home would I have um, that has the um, that's going to give me the very best quality of life? And I would say that I want a warm home that is low cost and feels good. And if we insulate our homes, if I insulate my home, it'll give me a warm home that feels good and is low cost and can reduce the carbon footprint from the home part of my uh, footprint by up to 80 percent. And what about transport? If I want to pursue the greatest quality of life, what kind of transport would I want? I would say um, that I like to be chauffeur driven, um, like the millionaires and the billionaires. And if I go by um, public transport, train or bus, or I share a lift with a friend and take it in turns, shared transport, I'm chauffeur driven. I love trains and buses because I get to read novels and I often don't have enough time to read the novels that I want to read. So if I get to go by bus, I can do some extra reading, improves my quality of life. And public transport or shared transport can reduce your carbon footprint by up to 80% in that area of your footprint. Now with food, what kind of food would give me the highest quality of life? I would like the most delicious food, please, the most nutritious food, and the food with the lowest amount of toxins. And local seasonal organic food has the highest of those three qualities, and it can reduce your carbon footprint not only by 80%, Food is the one area of our carbon footprint that can have a negative carbon footprint. If farming is done in the right way, 
it absorbs CO2 and buries it in the soil. And the soil organic matter content goes up each year, 5%, 5.1%, 5.2%, 5.3%. That is sequestering soil in uh, sequestering carbon dioxide in the soil. And actually, agriculture globally is the biggest solution that we have as the human race to draw down atmospheric CO2 emissions and the IPCC, as the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change estimates that if correctly managed, global agriculture could sequester one third of current total global uh, human created CO2 emissions. So it's the biggest, it, it could be the biggest uh, chance we've got to draw down that trillion tonnes of CO2 from the atmosphere. I've also recently been reading up on seaweed, growing seaweed in the oceans. Um, which can also produce food maybe, but also can produce fertilizer and also um, can absorb CO2 even faster So um, than, than, than agriculture. So that's food, but coming back to the question of quality of life. Um, so um, that's food. Uh, and then holidays. What kind of holidays would give me the best, best quality of life? And I would like to think that for me, um, I found over my life that the holidays that that make me feel most satisfied and fulfilled are ones where I have an inner journey. If I go on a big long outer journey, but I don't change at all, I don't feel like I've changed at all as a person, I tend not to feel very satisfied, I've noticed. Because I might go just on a, um, a you know, a, um, a week, a long weekend break bre to Cornwall from Devon. And if I meet some people and, and I have a walk on the beautiful Cornish cliffs and, and I feel like I've changed, I've seen something new in my life, it's, I've, I've had an inner journey, then it's most satisfying. And I've found that ground level transport provides the, the greatest inner journey and traveling by ground level transport instead of flying can reduce the carbon footprint from your holidays by up to 80%. And then what kind of products would give me the highest quality of life. I would like to have the most beautiful products, the most user-friendly products, and the products that last the longest amount of time. And purchasing high quality, long-lasting products can reduce your carbon footprint by up to 80% in that area. So I hope you can now start to see this very strong connection between what we might be searching for to get the best quality of life and how that will reduce our carbon footprint. So, are you ready to take action? Here are the 10 most effective things you can do to raise your quality of life while reducing your carbon footprint. Insulate your home or office. Be warmer, save money on fuel bills and feel good. And you can save up to two tonnes of CO2 per person per year. Now, uh, important for us to um, bear in mind while we're going through these, that let's imagine I mean, maybe that people here, some people here have a smaller carbon footprint than the national average and some bigger than the national average. Let's just imagine, especially if we don't know what our carbon footprint is at the moment. Um, let's just imagine we're the UK average of 15 tonnes. And let's just say, according to my suggestion, uh, if, if you um, like my suggestion, then a good target is to reduce that by, say, 8% per year because um, it's nice bite-sized chunks that's achievable, and if you do that for 10 years, that's 80% reduction in your carbon footprint. So that would be a reduction, a saving, or a reduction of 1.2 tonnes a year. So insulating your home or office, for some people that means saving up for some time, because um, it can be quite a big job, and you can do it in, in different stages. You can insulate what I call the low-hanging fruit, loft insulation, draft proofing, second field double glazing, they're quite easy and low cost. And then you could do wall and floor insulation later on. Um, but um, once you've done the whole lot, that would save up to two tons per person per year. So you, if you insulate your home this year, forget about your carbon footprint for the rest of the year. Don't need to worry about it. Just carry on the same as you were last year. Um, but then next year, you might want to think about doing something else. Next, switch to a renewable electricity company is a very easy step that gives you peace of mind and can save up to one ton of CO2 per person per year. It's what they call a, a, an easy win. Um, and worth bearing in mind that even all the renewable uh, electricity companies still has, have to use the, the national grid um, to top up on electricity when there's no wind and no sunshine. 
a steel day in the winter or something like that. And so um, in the carbon savvy carbon footprint calculators, and we have three carbon footprint calculators, according to how much time you've got, you can do your carbon footprint in one minute, you can do it in five minutes, or you can do it in, in four, you can take 40 minutes doing it in great detail. Um, but we only give you a 50% reduction in your carbon footprint of electricity, even if you're with a renewable electricity company, because we say that some of it is still coming from the grid. But that still can save up to one tonne of CO2 per person per year. Travel differently to work. Share a lift on a 40 minute daily commute can save two tonnes of CO2 per person per year. Um, just halving your carbon footprint or using public transport uh, for more social time, rest and recuperation. Um, is going to reduce your carbon footprint even more than sharing a lift with one person. Cycling and walking are the best of, cool, of, of, of all. If if you and e-bikes are amazing. If your work if your work is say five to ten miles from home, you might find you could do that quite a lot of the time by e-bike. Um, and some people do that by bicycle. And one friend who cycles twelve miles to work every morning and twelve miles every, every evening, he says it it um, psychs me up for work in the morning and it de-stresses me at the end of the day. He's a guitar teacher in a, in a public school, so, um, but, you know, keeps him fit and energised. And the knock-on effects of that kind of level of exercise are quite astounding on our quality of life, health and well-being. Downsize your vehicles or go electric. Um, save money on fuel and insurance, plus parking will be easier and you can save up to a tonne of CO2. Obviously, that depends on the size of the vehicle before, the size of the vehicle afterwards and how many miles a year. If you only if you have a four by four and you never use it and you only do 500 miles a year, better to keep your old four by four. It doesn't matter if it's a gas guzzling four, guzzling four by four if you hardly use it. It also suggests that we have to be very careful I, I, I'm like, I like to promote a kind of very inclusive, guilt-free approach to low carbon lifestyles. Um, and so we don't really know if we see someone else driving a four by four, if they do lots of miles or not many miles. So just the car that someone drives doesn't actually tell you what their carbon footprint is. Um, somebody, somebody in a small car might do a lot of miles and someone in a big car might do less miles. So it's encouraged me over the years to try not to point my finger at other people and concentrate on what I can do in my own carbon footprint. Source seasonal, local and organic food for improved flavour and nutrition, less toxins for better health and it supports wildlife. Organic food, when I'm um, in the organic shop and um, I'm looking at a packet of oats, say, and, and the packet of oats costs two pounds. And I know that in the supermarket, I could get the same packet of oats for one pound non-organic. What I see when, I, when I'm reaching out for that packet of organic oats is I see all these fields and hedgerows that are full of birds and insects and bees and butterflies. And I imagine cycling on my next holiday down through those fields. And I'm buying not just the oats, I'm buying the beautiful world that I want to live in and I'm buying the beautiful place that I want to be in on holiday. But when I buy those, when I'm looking at those um, non-organic oats, oats in the supermarket, I'm seeing these massive fields with great big tractors and, and, and all in perfect lines and the hedgerows are dead and the field margins are dead and there aren't so many um, insects because that is what the difference between organic and non-organic means, that organic has no use of pesticides and herbicides. So it helps me to remember that every time I buy something that's non-organic, I personally am contributing a little bit of money to pouring some pesticides and herbicides somewhere that is poisoning some little insects and therefore poisoning the birds. And you may have heard that we've lost more than half of the birds in the UK um, by, by quantity in the last 50 years. And they're suffering because there's not enough uh, vibrant hedgerows. So organic food is good for your health. Uh, and it's good for your carbon footprint, but also really wonderful for wildlife. Reduce meat and dairy consumption. So eat less quantity, but higher quality local grass fed meat can improve your health, encourage creative cooking and save you money. And you can save perhaps around some people say it's much more than this. It depends how much meat you eat. Um, but let's just say you can save around um, half a ton of CO2 per person per year. Um, and 
given that we live in Devon, many people, you know, University of Plymouth, I live in Devon, we're, we're based in Devon, um, but, or people in Cornwall as well. And there's so many um, meat and dairy farmers here. Um, I've got friends who, who are beef farmers and say, Muxie, how can you be telling everyone to reduce their meat, meat consumption? What are you going to do to my livelihood? And so I like to say, no, no, my friend. Um, if people purchase, instead of purchasing imported meat, people purchase local high quality meat from you, that will reduce their carbon footprint. And so actually Devon and Cornwall farmers will actually have more business than they have at the moment. And hopefully people might also be willing to pay higher prices if they're only eating half, half the quantity of meat. Um, and British meat has on average a quarter of the carbon footprint of international uh, meat, simply because so much of it is grass fed. And also should say, because this is important, it's a very contentious issue. Meat, meat is also not a solution to climate change. So we can't also pretend that Eating meat is completely fine and has no carbon footprint. It depends on how the meat is produced. And so it's, or if it's organic, seasonal, local, grass fed, and the cattle density is not too high and all of these factors, then meat can have a, 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 um, a, a very small carbon footprint or even a negative carbon footprint. But uh, much of the meat produced in industrial intensive farming, etc., has a very high carbon footprint. So it's, it's quite a nuanced question, this one. I, I wanted to um, make that clear. Ditch a two hour premium return flight. Taking the train instead will avoid airport stress, save checking in time, and you'll enjoy the journey far more. And I, my sister lives in um, Spain, so I quite often um, take the train from London to Barcelona to go and visit her and my niece and about once every year or once every two years. And it's 10 hours from London to Barcelona and you get to see beautiful scenes of um, the flamingos, pink flamingos in the south of France and the, and the Pyrenees. So it's a wonderful experience. Save a seven hour economy return flight, visit a closer destination and save time and money. Or if you really feel that you have to fly uh, far afield, can you fly half as often and stay twice as long? I.e., can you fly every other year to Thailand and stay for a month instead of going every year for two weeks because that will half your carbon footprint and provide a more satisfying travel experience. Purchase high quality, long lasting products, save shopping time money, and you'll have the pleasure of using top quality products. Every penny is a vote. We vote once, the, once every four years for the, nas the uh, national election. Um, and sometimes we give a bit of our money to charity and feel good about that. But by spending your money carefully is a way to give 100% of your salary to charity every year, in my understanding of the word. Because when I'm paying all the money to like local organic shops for my food and giving it to ethical companies that are producing high quality, long lasting products, and it's basically spending all my money on low carbon solutions, actually, or the low carbon of the choices that I've got of the things I have to buy. It's a way of feeling that I'm kind of giving all my money to buying the world that I want to live in in the future, which I think is going to be a beautiful, fantastic, exciting uh, world, the, the low carbon world that we're moving towards where our quality of life is going to be far higher than it is today in the UK. Repair, reuse and buy half your product second hand. You'll save money so you can afford higher quality products. And buying from others also enhances the community spirit. And so that's the 10 things. Here's some tips to make it fun. Calculate your footprint. And you can do that on the Carbon Savvy website. And, and it holds it and it compares it to your next one and your next time so you can keep track of it. And you get the feel-good factor of reducing your carbon footprint. Take it in bite-sized chunks, um, just 8% um, per year. As a target, if you exceed your target and then decide you want to do more, no problem. But if you're setting yourself up for success, it's more enjoyable. Start with the easiest areas first. If you're worried, oh, I can't afford to insulate my home. Don't worry. Forget about your home completely. Just think, oh, maybe you can afford to buy um, some organic food or maybe you can, uh, you can do some gardening or maybe actually transport's an easier one to look at. So for everybody, there's one area of your life that's easy. Um, to look at and if you start with that one and put the others off for future years and, and um, that will make it an easy experience. Cut the dull emissions, keep the fun ones. 
reduce the um, share a lift to work so that you're reducing that daily commute, which is boring, but still go to the theatre. You know, occasionally go to the theatre or gig, driving by yourself or something, just do it because that won't affect your overall annual carbon footprint very much and you will keep the enjoyment in your life. Otherwise, we start to feel, well, oh, I can't do anything in this low carbon lifestyle. My life's so boring. I can't go to a gig. I can't go and ride, ride to see this friend or that friend. And you feel like you're being restricted. We don't want that. It's not going to improve our quality of life. There's a way to cut your carbon footprint that's fun. And it's just putting things in order of priority. Um, there's room for treats. You can have papayas, mangoes on your birthday, Christmas. We can still experience those things, but it's the weekly shop. If we've got buying local um, seasonal organic food every week, that, that affects our big carbon footprint. And finally, monitor your enjoyment. You can take a quality of life calculator on the Carbon Savvy website as well. And it's really interesting process. I do it myself more than once a year. And I'm like, oh, yeah, well, I need to improve the quality of my sleep, actually. Oh, and exercise actually helps me sleep more. And so it helps me improve my quality of life. But also you start to see that as your carbon footprint reduces, your quality of life tends to go up. These 10 actions can reduce CO2 emissions by 80% while raising personal well-being. Saving energy increases financial resilience of organizations, and this virtuous circle of life encourages energy, enthusiasm, and motivation, and is more attractive and influential to others. And you can calculate your carbon footprint with the Carbon Savvy Taster Calculator. Your carbon footprint is personal, just like your bank account, so there's no need to disclose it to anyone, because otherwise we start feeling guilty. Um, so if you would like, and we can run this at the same time as questions, um, but um, there's an opportunity. This is a one minute um, carbon footprint calculator. So um, this is an opportunity um, to take that, or I, I don't know how to get that link into, the, uh, into a place where you can click it. Um, maybe, I, let me just try and paste it into the chat, see if I can do that. Just a second. And then if you start, we're coming towards the Q&A. So um, I think there's going to be um, questions coming up. But I'm just going to try and paste this link for you quickly. Thank you, Mukti. And thank you for a really great presentation. Very inspiring as normal. Um, oh, just a no. quick, quick mention, I'm actually um, doing a carbon savvy course at the moment. I'm only halfway through something that, that, that Mukti runs. And it's really interesting and inspiring. So thank you for that. Um, so with regard to questions, um, you did mention carbon negative agriculture, which sparked a note in my mind. What would that look like in the UK? Thank you. Sorry, it's taking me a little moment to get this, work out how to get this link to you. I'm, I'm almost there. Well, I've got the link. Okay. Got the link. Um, there with me, I'm almost there. Oops. Oh dear. Sorry, everybody, for keeping you waiting. Oh, my screen. Okay, so my screen's gone into a pause. I'm going to just carry on and answer the question. So, so um, uh, with agriculture, it reduce um, the carbon footprint. Is that right? Sorry, the question. Yeah, you mentioned the phrase carbon negative agriculture. So yeah. What, what would that look like in practice in the UK? Because obviously we've got a certain type of agricultural uh, look in the UK. How would that appear if it was um, carbon negative? Yeah, so carbon negative basically is all to do with the soil. Um, it's, it's, it's not much fuel you're your tractors and combine harvesters and things that's not much to do there's a little tiny bit of your carbon footprint and it's even not so much to do with transport so a low uh, an organic carrot from kenya eaten in the uk has a lower carbon footprint than an intent and load in the uk because the most important thing is the biological process is taking place in the soil and so what we need to do the soil um has an organic matter content which is anywhere between 1% and 10%. Rich forest floors, 1% in industrial farmed uh, land because it's been run down. 
And so we need to increase the soil uh, carbon content. That's the biggest thing. And the way to do that is you avoid deep plowing. So you try deep plowing because plowing. The carbon in the soil is exposed to the air, the wind comes down, the oxygen mixes with carbon, and it, and it lifts off carbon dioxide content into the soil. Um, and um, also, it disturbs the microbial function. They take the carbon from the roots of the plants and they, they turn it into a really stable compound that remains in the soil for years without wafting off into the atmosphere, etc. So, um, preserving the, the health of the soils is really important. And then, green manures is one of the biggest things. So, growing when the, when the, when the soils so if you're growing vegetables, every four years you would put one part of your farm into fallow and you grow green manures like clover and rye and they fix nitrogen in the soil, which is a greenhouse gas, which absorbs uh, nitrous oxide, which is a greenhouse gas. And um, they also fix carbon content. And so, um, and the other wood chip like willow chip or... Um, um, putting on um, manure from cattle or indeed putting on seaweed which to the oceans then you bring the seaweed turn into fertilizer put it on the soil that gets absorbed in the soil and increases the soil I think those are the main things and some of today's um, organic farms have got a big negative carbon footprint and there's one guy who's, who's producing organic beef that claims with every kilo of organic beef that you buy from him you're sequestering 65 kilos of CO2. Wow. And that's amazing. And there's a great tool called the um, Carbon Toolkit. You can Google the Farm Carbon Toolkit. It's an agricultural carbon footprint calculator that I was on the first version of 15 years ago. It's come a long way since then. And I have. Well, um, but that's a whole tool. And you can calculate your carbon footprint for any site. They got a fantastic, and, that, and of course, um, um, you can trade carbon reductions on the European same 25 uh, pounds a ton. And so, I hope that the farmers of Devon and Cornwall, in fact, all the farmers of the UK who are very sad but don't who find it quite difficult to earn a living at the moment, uh, in a way, we leave the EU. Um, they can actually, by doing carbon, they can all trade the carbon that they're in the soils and get more income. Absolutely. And that's that's a real positive note. And that's that's what's come across a lot in your presentation. I think I've got a question here from Suzanne Rosner, who's saying she just loves your perspective of actually by reducing your carbon footprint. It's a positive move for the whole of your life. Exactly. He's actually asking the question, what inspired your unique and positive perspective? Yeah, thank you. It's lovely. Um, you can hear me clearly because it was breaking up a little bit a minute ago, so let me know if there's any trouble with the sound. Um, yeah. Started off ideas around me in, in quite a green world um, um, but I was coming from a point of view of sort of guilt and um, um, difficult it is grit my teeth and and I was quite I found after a few years I was alienating my friends and family and sort of friends and family their eyes would glaze over when I started talking about carbon footprints um, and I was starting to lose you know people didn't want to hang out with me if I get on one about the planet, then it, it's uh, not 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 much fun. So I it wasn't working, and I had to revise my approach. And I was I was making myself fun. fun. I thought, well, actually, if I want to sort of inspire, I can't be around trying to bash people. And if I could, would I want to? I actually like to make all my own decisions of my own life and be, you know. The, life and if I want to do that surely everybody else with their own lives to do or I can't um suggest or put pressure to do something people want to do something or the reason that for the pure joy of it and because I choose to and so I say Oh, I think we've 
lost Mukti. Okay, Millie, have we lost Mukti? Sorry, Millie's the technical support. Yes. Okay. Right. What we've done is posted the calculator, the carbon savvy calculator into the feed. So please feel free to click on that. So you've got that after the session finishes. Um, and please do visit our discussion boards today. There's one particularly around carbon footprinting. So if anything inspired you particularly about Mukti's presentation um, and that you want to uh, put in there to simulate more conversation, please do. Um, so unless Mukti comes back, I think we should just close this presentation now. Thank you very much for coming. Please take some time to have a look through tomorrow's um, agenda to find out what you'd like to attend. And um, we look forward to seeing all of you back tomorrow.